Hello, I'm Ruth Ashby. I blog under the name of Ruth Walker and I am Assistant Head for Curriculum at the Telford Priory School. At our school, we are committed to powerful knowledge for global citizens. So we passionately believe that there is powerful knowledge, there is best knowledge within the subject disciplines and that although there may and indeed should be a healthy debate about what particular best knowledge ought to be included in school curriculum, the idea of having a school curriculum that is composed of carefully chosen knowledge because it is what we believe to be the best knowledge uh, is what we think is the entitlement of all of our students regardless of background, regardless of starting point and we believe that it is our moral duty as teachers and as leaders to ensure that all of our students access that curriculum and can be successful at it. So that's what we're about and this presentation hopefully draws together some of the things that I've learned in leading curriculum in our school and in other work that I've um, been fortunate enough to do with um, some other sort of schools and organisations um, as part of my role. So before we get started on uh, some things that we should and should not do as curriculum leaders, I'd like to spend a bit of time uh, just thinking about what we might mean by curriculum. So if we're defining curriculum as the substance of what is taught, so the knowledge, skills, attributes, awarenesses, the, the things that our students will leave us with in their brains that they didn't have previously um, and how that is structured over time for us to deliver it in a school. If that is what we're defining as curriculum, then for me, leadership of curriculum um, from the point of view of SLT uh, should be about these four things really. So I think that we want the curriculum across the school to be very ambitious and to be of a high quality. I think that we want um, curriculum to be well mapped. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? I mean, um, if subjects have thought carefully about the different strands of knowledge in their subjects, having an appropriate balance of those different strands. So that might be practical in theory, it might be substantive and disciplinary, different subjects and in, in different individuals have got different uh, lexicons for these strands. But what's important, I think, is having them identified one way or another and, and having that balance. Um, the sequencing of the material of the units um, and the sequencing of the, the, the on the smaller scale so of the the, um, the lessons themselves and the explanations even within the lessons uh, mapping for progression so identification of what the components of progress are within a subject and uh, mapping them across time so that they can uh, successively build on each other and feed into each other mapping for things like retrieval and interweaving and spacing of certain ideas so that students can have a really meaningful um, journey through their curriculum. I think that's one of the goals certainly that we should always be aiming for in our curriculum leadership. Um, this idea of a minimum guarantee, I think, uh, we talk a lot about codification in our school and about nailing things down. Uh, so we use um, predominantly a booklet model, but certainly not for all subjects, but we uh, seek out codification one way or another of as much as is possible the detail of the substance of what is taught because what that means then is that the experience of students in relation to the curriculum isn't down to the chance of what teacher they get the experience of the teacher uh, the personal interests of the teacher it's all nailed down as i said in a central document so that we can be confident that if this is the best curriculum then every child in our school will receive this curriculum and that's a really um, strong starting point I think for our students. Um, and then finally obviously what we want as, as curriculum leaders is for that curriculum to, to come alive in the classroom and to be experienced um, in a meaningful way by our students. Now a lot of that um, uh, crosses over into the realm of, of teaching and learning and um, you know I, I could do a whole presentation on um, you know my love for teach like a champion and various sort of techniques and and things that I think are um, vital for a school's progress in terms of the successful enactment of a curriculum but that's not what I want to talk about here um, for me very much the curriculum can never be uh, defined solely by the codification because it will only be effectively enacted in the classroom by a teacher who 
who understands and is engaged with thinking behind that curriculum, who can see the big picture of the sequencing, um, who is aware of the prior knowledge that will feed into what's being taught and what's coming up in future months, even years, uh, that this lesson and the content of this lesson will feed into and be built upon. Uh, somebody who is consciously aware of the different strands of knowledge within a subject and the balance uh, of that, those strands. Um, somebody who engages with um, debates kind of at the boundaries of the subject and, and arguments that might be being had as to um, the nature of some of the claims made by the subject and the contested um, status of some of the claims that, that might be made within the, the materials of a subject. All of that is such a strong uh, kind of schema, if you like, that a, a teacher can bring to a classroom. And without that, a booklet is just a booklet. There's, there's useful knowledge encoded in it, but it can never really be um, in, you know, very effectively taught. Uh, certainly a teacher who's got a rich schema and curriculum understanding is well prepared for questions by the students, uh, can plan well uh, for misconceptions, can think carefully about their explanations in a much more meaningful way. So that level of, uh, or that side of enactment is something that I think is the responsibility of curriculum leadership within a school. Okay, so on to our do's and don'ts. Uh, the first don't is a set of three temptations. And I think these are all things that we um, have been seduced by at one point or another, certainly I have. Um, so the first thing I think that we need to be watching out for is this idea of quick fixes. Um, curriculum can never be uh, fixed quickly. One, because um, actually it's not something to ever be fixed in a permanent or final sense, I think. Curriculum um, is not something that is done and completed and ticked off and then we can move on to the next priority. A department with a fantastic curriculum and a fantastic curriculum way of working will always be discussing and debating and developing their curriculum so it's not something that ever is finished. In addition to that, um, you know, obviously lots of schools are in a position where they're looking at their curriculum and thinking, well, hang on, there are some significant uh, improvements that we'd like to make. Um, and absolutely, you know, I, I, I understand that to be the case. And, and certainly we were in the same position um, sort of a year, two years ago at my own school. And the, this task of um, not finally fixing the curriculum, but improving it to a state where we're happy with it and all students have got a high quality and ambitious curriculum. Um, that is not something that can be transformed overnight or in a matter of weeks or months you know the scale of the project is a big one and we need to recognize that you know if you're sort of seeking to reform curriculum across all subjects um, for all year groups as many schools are because curriculum has of course not been a focus of, of so many schools for so long because of various reasons um, that's a big job and if we don't recognize it as such I think that we will not be able to do it justice so in my school, uh, we set it as a three year timeline to um, completely reform and codify curriculum across all years um, for all subjects. And uh, obviously we were building on a lot of strengths that were there in the first place, but we, we absolutely hadn't given curriculum um, the, the thought that um, we now uh, seeking to do. We've been focused, we, we, we had other priorities um, at the time as, as many other schools have done. So. Um, it's very important to recognise the scale of the task and to, to plan accordingly, I, I would say. The next temptation is genericism. So, of course, the seminal thinker in the fight against genericism is Christine Council with her wonderful blog, Genericism Children. Um, so what do I mean by genericism? I mean a one size fits all approach, um, a centralised criteria that all subjects must. Uh, meet for curriculum items, uh, centralised proformers and formats for documentation and that kind of thing. And that's a sort of standard thing in a school, isn't it, to have a, a, a generic thing that you send out to 
subjects to complete, but it's absolutely devastatingly damaging for curriculum because the subjects are really very different. You know, they have got different objects of study. Some subjects study the natural world, some st subjects study um, the products of human creativity, some subjects um, are reflective, some subjects are um, objectivist or, or, or seek to be objective. The, the knowledge structure is arranged in different ways within the subject. So some subjects have got very tight, very organized structures of knowledge. Some subjects have got much more sort of chaotic uh, webs. The uh, subjects have got different ways of, of working, of the people participating in the subjects. They've got different ways of approving knowledge of whether it should be accepted to within the discipline. Um, you know, I could go on and on. And if we don't respect those differences and reflect them in the work that we ask subjects to carry out, then we will be forcing our subjects into a mould that doesn't fit them and we effectively will break them and the quality of curriculum work will be the poorer for it. Um, so an example of this that we have in our school is that um, if a subject uh, doesn't feel that uh, the booklet model, we use booklets for lots of our subjects, but we don't require it because if a booklet is not appropriate, because um, it, it would work better within a practical lesson, for example, to use a PowerPoint or some other form of codification, like a teacher handbook, um, we absolutely would encourage subject leaders and, and departments to work with an alternative model that fits the nature of their subject. Um, Related to that then is uh, the temptation to have over-centralised leadership and this is a, a, an essential tension really in curriculum leadership I think but um, it's not insurmountable. I think particularly if you want uh, significant changes to be made in curriculum there is an urge isn't there to have uh, quite a tight control um, and oversight of uh, the changes that are being made uh, to curriculum by subjects and that's never going to lead to um, highly successful curriculum work in terms of mapping and uh, codification as, as we mentioned before because it's impossible for any single member of staff to be a specialist in all of the school subjects you know I think we teach 14 different subjects in our school I could never become specialist enough in all of those subjects in order to um, direct the detail of what I think curriculum development should be like in order to be ambitious and powerful knowledge and balanced and well sequenced and all of those things it's just not you know, cognitively possible or, or possible in terms of time so we have to relinquish uh, 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 that control to a, to a great extent and um, you know there's, a, there's an obvious temptation not to do that. However that doesn't mean that we have to write it off as a free-for-all um, and just kind of uh, ask departments just to do whatever they want and we'll see you all again in a year and see where we're up to with curriculum. Um, it's possible to very carefully um, oversee and guide and be a part of um, curriculum developments within uh, within your school without um, sort of falling prey to this issue of being a non-specialist and, and, and having to make decisions outside of your own areas of expertise. So some of the um, other things that we talk about later in this presentation will be about how to strike that balance between um, leadership and um, devolving expertise to subject specialists. Um, before we look at that though, I just want to kind of have a cautionary note about um, terminology. Um, anyone who reads my blogs will know that I'm really interested in things like substantive and disciplinary knowledge and vertical and hierarchical and cumulative and integrative structures um, and all that kind of thing. And all that stuff is really, really interesting and it, it is actually really useful for senior leadership, I think, to be able to um, reflect on the differences between subjects in terms of those um, concepts and, and pieces of curricular theory. Uh, it's useful to kind of get at the, the nature and to sort of see, see the internal um, structures of those subjects. However, 
that doesn't mean that um, everyone else in the school has got to go along with all of that terminology as well. I mean, it, it, it can be really useful for um, subject staff and subject leaders to think about um, those areas, but it's definitely not essential. And it's definitely not essential for um, excellence in curricular thinking either. You know, you can absolutely have a subject leader who um, understands their subject incredibly well, can identify different strands of knowledge, um, can see the whole big picture of the curriculum and can map the progression in the curriculum, is crystal clear about the components um, uh, of, of success and how they should be taught and when they should be taught and how they can feed into each other um, and what great explanations look like and all of these wonderful curriculum things. Um, and to then ask them to sort of make that fit with a certain set of um, terminology like the words I've just mentioned could just be a complete and utter waste of their time couldn't it if they've already got that thinking but uh, just aren't using the same words as you so although I do think that a shared language um, is also uh, can be useful but um, I think that the substance of the curriculum planning is much more important than any kind of set of words that we might choose to to put on it so um, by all means I think it's it's really beneficial for um, SLT to uh, learn about curricular theory if you have responsibility for curriculum or teaching and learning or assessment um, but I would caution against kind of a wholesale uh, use of all of that um, jargon ultimately with everybody in your school so how can we um, balance this tension then between the need for um, leadership centrally and uh, the need for um, a recognition of the value of the subject's uh, specialisms? The, the way to go about this, uh, in my view, um, and I'm incredibly grateful to Christine Council for her guidance in this, is to develop the departments within the school in terms of their engagement with the subject discourse. Um, and through that engagement, through that discussion, um, subjects work in terms of planning of curriculum, decisions about content, decisions about mapping, um, understanding of the principles behind the mapping across the department, uh, the, the fine detail of the codification in terms of booklets um, and the, the types of practice and activities that are planned for students in lessons in order to bring them into that that curriculum and to practice that knowledge all of that work is infinitely improved and continuously developed uh, by engagement of a department with the subject discourse so what do we mean by the subject discourse well um it's quite a it can be quite um i don't want to say anarchic but um it's not it doesn't have to be a tightly controlled um set of written articles for example um, I mean the hi history is the kind of poster boy for this the, the historical association and the journal teaching history are uh, just incredible resources for the history subject community um, and represent um, absolutely mind-blowingly uh, intellectual and thoughtful reflections by history teachers largely um, on the the nature of curriculum um, curricular decisions um, and, uh, and teaching associated with that. Um, not all subject associations are at the same stage or even have got the same goals uh, and that's okay because the discourse is much wider of course than the subject associations. So uh, Edu Twitter is a wonderful resource um, and it, it can be used in, um, you know, I think it's very easy to sort of tell people to go and get on Twitter but the way that people use it it is um, can be really, really, um, you know, can, can be more or less effective. So things like, um, you know, certain subjects have hashtags or chats that are scheduled. That's a really good way to get involved in subject specific um, conversations um, and just reaching out to specialists and um, asking them for suggestions for reading is a really um, productive way of engaging in the discourse. And I am always overwhelmed by the generosity of people with their time and brain power um, in asking my subject specific questions that I sort of ask them um, in the evening when something pops into my head and I want to understand it. Um, it is um, an incredible 
resource for furthering subject knowledge and just engaging in in these kind of discussions but also just to meet people and to, to make those links and to become part of this um, ongoing conversation which is I guess the subject discipline. Um, as well as Edu Twitter of course there's blogs and um, and an increasing number of subject specific books and all of this uh, not only exists but it can be it, it's possible to um, curate these kind of uh, resources and guide departments in certain directions um, that you feel are aligned with your vision as a school obviously there's a, there's a range of um, resources and thinkers out there and not all of them will be aligned with the, the school vision uh, so part I think of the job of leadership is to critically evaluate uh, what's out there and to make some choices about starting points um, for, for for this engagement of departments. Um, the other uh, thing that I would strongly encourage uh, curriculum leaders to do is to reach out to individual subject specialists um, and ask uh, if they would be happy to be informal links uh, with the school for subject specialism and um, this is something that we've done in our school and we've been so lucky with um, the responses of people and um, we always try and sort of pay it back and offer um, other you know visits or um, whatever we can um, in, in quid pro quo but um, you know nevertheless it is incredibly generous of people to share their time and expertise with us in that way um, and what that means is that we've then got um, just a sort of a, a, a second opinion, a second pair of eyes on the end of an email um, that we can send booklets to for, for suggestions, for feedback. Um, if we've got a, a, a query about something, um, I asked a curriculum leader the other day to uh, just email one of our specialist links just to ask them about, we were unclear about some wording in the national curriculum. Um, and rather than kind of agonizing over what we think it means, um, we can just email a specialist that might be further along this journey than we are and ask for their opinion. And that's just a wonderful thing to have, both on the kind of concrete level of the, the, the information and the, the discussion that comes out of it, but also I think in building a culture in departments that you know, we are part of a great conversation and that this whole world exists out there of wonderful thinkers um, and people engaging in that discourse and that all of our members of, of, of our departments are part of that great conversation as well. I think that's an incredibly powerful cultural um, thing to add to the school. And alongside that, I think it's very important to intentionally build a culture within a school in which um, this kind of curriculum thinking can really flourish. Because if you've got a department um, that is constantly working on outstanding, um, oh, oh, I said that word, sorry, on absolutely wonderful you know, curriculum planning, if they're always engaged in discussing you know, optimal sequencing and the best way of explaining a certain concept or um, you know what what pedagogical strategies are, are best suited to particular aspects of the curriculum you know those kind of conversations are so powerful and they can only take place in a certain kind of culture so like if you don't have the right culture um, a question about the curriculum can come across as quite challenging or even confrontational. I think if, if the culture is wrong, people can be very, people can feel quite precious about, um, about curricular work. People can feel that um, almost they are embodied in the booklet that they wrote perhaps or something. And that if anybody wants to change anything in that, then that they're trying to, it's like trying to cut your arm off or something like that. And um, all of those sort of, feelings are natural outcomes of of certain types of culture in a school and i think we need to be really intentional to build our culture uh, so that it's not that kind of culture so that we are constantly open and seeking uh, open to to feedback um so that we welcome discussion as progressive rather than um uh, criticizing um 
and that kind of culture doesn't just arise and emerge out of thin air just because we want it to i think we have to reflect uh, that, that kind of culture around the school so a lot of this kind of um I, th I think a lot of schools have got a culture of sort of quite high stakes uh, or, or people are quite sensitive to feedback or criticism and that is due largely to things like high stakes observations and performance management practice and things so i think if you want people to be receptive to um, discussion and to constant to be constantly seeking to develop things uh, you've got to remove the idea that um, you know you will be judged on a, a, a superficial observation and, and, and terrible things could happen because of that judgment so in our school we don't have high stakes um, observations uh, we don't have graded observations and um, we you know that's very much an intentional part of uh, building this culture so that people are in, a, in, in the right frame of mind to, to, to be always developing and thinking about curriculum um, so I've mentioned about the um, getting subject specialist links in, however, uh, it's not the case that just because you can't be a subject specialist uh, in all the areas that you have to be a complete subject ignoramus in, you know, like 13 out of the 14 areas and you only know anything about your own subject. It's absolutely possible and desirable uh, for SLT to learn enough about the subjects uh, in, in order to well to do these two things I think we need to be able to quality assure if we're directing people to um, blogs and, and books and things we need to be able to check that we think that they are of, of good enough of, of, of excellent quality um, and also we need to be able to have uh, in you know subject specific conversations in-house as part of our leadership so we need to be able to talk to subjects and ask them about what's happening in their curriculum and to be able to understand uh, what they're talking about when they're talking about their subject so how can we learn about the subjects um, I would start by reading specifications textbooks um, it, having a go at the GCSE um, ourselves uh, and again this this whole discourse on on Twitter and asking questions of subject specialists on Twitter um, an example that comes to mind is um, I asked for some help understanding the Trinity from religious studies uh, a few months ago and I had a great response from lots of um, religious studies specialists across the country um, and I still don't understand it actually but I, <laughs> I, um, I, I've got less of a terrible lack of understanding I think I think I, I understand a bit more about how complicated it is and about why it's hard to understand so um, that's put me in a much stronger position to, to discuss you know, that sort of area um, with the religious studies department. So that's really powerful. Um, having said that um, curriculum is a long task and that it needs to be led by departments um, and, and by that subject specialism, um, and I absolutely you know, endorse that view, but I think it's, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think that if, if, if a immediate uh, need is identified, that that shouldn't be fixed straight away if it, if it is a quick fix. So, you know, one hears of schools where um, it, it comes to light that certain sections of the specification are just not included in the curriculum. Um, and that would be something where I think, you know, a, a, a very speedy guidance um, slash intervention is entirely appropriate because you know, students deserve to have as, as high a quality curriculum as we possibly can get. And so if, if that is something that can be uh, altered quickly, then I wouldn't want anyone to shy away and, and wait for kind of departments to come to that um, realisation for themselves. Um, have to say that hasn't been something that, that we've had as an issue ourselves but you know I think people need to be prepared um, but don't forget that this can only ever be a quick fix and um, there is no substitute for the sustained and deep engagement of departments with the subject discourse and community so finally I'd like to finish with uh, this little initialization that I have that I just think are the big six themes if you like for school leadership so it's BMW CCC um, and they stand for first of all behavior um, if we want 
staff to be able to think about curriculum, to be inclined to uh, really switch their brains on and engage in really quite heavy duty intellectual work, then they need to be well rested and not stressed. And so behaviour has got to be, um, if not yet impeccable, staff need to be clear that expectations are high and that systems are uh, you know, well functioning and um, consistent. Um, and in addition to that, I think that the high expectations thing is really important as well, because if you don't have really high expectations of, of children and if teachers are relying on um, superficial engagement or ease of work to, um, to get students on board, then what ends up happening is you have a de facto narrowing of the curriculum because inevitably uh, material will be left out either deliberate, you know, intentionally as teachers, you know, of course, rationally choose um, alternative content because it will be more engaging or because the children won't push back against it because it's not too, because it's not challenging. Um, and, 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 and some students, as we know, prefer to take uh, an easier option in, in the first instance. Um, so we have to have a culture where we have high expectations of students and we expect them to work hard on, on challenging work and that we don't rely on it being, you know, every lesson, every science lesson is a, a, a something you set fire to something or create an explosion rather than learning about the you know, fundamental workings of the atom. It might be superficially less exciting, but um, you know, underneath it's, it's it's absolutely essential for that powerful knowledge and for that curriculum so teachers need to feel safe in delivering the intended curriculum um memory i haven't spoken about that yet um i must have forgotten um if we're saying that you know we're only really counting something as having been learned if students remember it then i think we need to be asking about um how curricula are designed to facilitate memory. So um, how they might be planned for retrieval, how um, uh, interweaving might be built in, uh, where spacing might be appropriate. Um, so that's something that I think should be at the forefront of, of all planning. Workload, um, again, for teachers to engage in curricular thinking and to produce excellent curriculum work and to enact curriculum highly effectively they need to be well rested and they need to feel as well that all the hard work that they do do is for um you know has a has a high impact and isn't just performative or a waste of time or just make some leaders life easier because then they've got a big folder of stuff that they can show to people for their their own evidencing or, or whatever so you know I think that the teachers in our school do work hard um, and everything that we do is a task that has a, a high impact on students learning we don't have performative um, marking or written reports we have centralized attentions um, booklets obviously I've mentioned all the, all the hornets that we can remove to to make teachers' lives um, easier and to make them make the work that they do do more effective um, uh, is really important. The other interesting thing, though, about um, workload is that when teachers get switched on to curriculum, um, they tend to uh, want to do much more work than is required. Um, so you get people, you know, tweeting late into the night about. Um, various subject debates, people giving up their Saturdays to go to conferences to hear more about this kind of thing. So people do kind of really um, get their brains set on fire a little bit. Um, and that's just a, a wonderful thing to see. But, but of course, it's really important that, um, you know, teachers are seeing that as, as, as something wonderful that they want to do um, and, and, and not that it's, you know, not, not that all these extra hours are not something that's required of them. Um, curriculum is obviously what this uh, presentation is about so probably not much to say there really apart from um, yeah, just to repeat really this idea that the substance of what is taught and careful thought about 
what is the most valuable knowledge that we can give to our children has got to be at the center of, of what any school does and you know i think that this knowledge that exists in the disciplines that's been built and developed and refined and sometimes fought for over the centuries and even millennia in the subject disciplines um, it is such a privilege and a responsibility to work in a school and be responsible for um, the passing on of that knowledge i don't know if that's the right term because it's not just a fixed thing that we transmit to our students it's a great conversation that we bring our students into we show them the subjects and we are saying to them you know that this this belongs to you you can be a part of this this subject you can join it and create new meaning discover new knowledge produce new ideas within this subject uh, if you choose and and pursue this subject as a specialist you know when you leave us and for everybody who who doesn't pursue a particular subject as a specialism the knowledge that they take with them then allows them to see all of that meaning in the world and to appreciate the world through all of these different lenses uh, to function in a democracy and to be um, a citizen in a you know we hope a truly global sense um, those are all wonderful and incredibly important things and um, yeah as I said it's a it's a privilege to be part of that and we certainly take it very seriously um, I mentioned about um, kind of a culture of feedback and uh, being open to discussion uh, so for me candor is one of the most important things in school leadership and I think that it's something that uh, needs building as a, as a cultural habit intentionally um, and then just a broader thing around culture so what are the what are the values that we intentionally enact in our school and this is reflected around all the things that I've already mentioned about around treating subject specialisms um, as we should be as, as unique and, and idiosyncratic um, having a focus on um, impactful work rather than performative work um, having a culture of warmth and safety where people um, feel supported uh, in giving feedback and in receiving feedback and all these kind of things um, you know I think it's easy to think that culture the culture that you want in a school will just emerge naturally naturally because of, of the kinds of things that you like and, and you want and believe um, naturally people are, are complicated and people schools often carry quite a lot of baggage because of sort of previous um, you know graded observations and all those kind of things and and we need to be quite intentional about um, about building culture in that context I believe so those are my do's and don'ts. Um, as I said at the start, I'm really keen to continue this conversation. So if there's anything you'd like to discuss, um, please do get in touch. Um, I'm always happy to talk about curriculum. Thanks very much. Bye.